My name is Louis Eve. I was born in New Orleans, Indiana in 1928, and I grew up there until I was 16 years old and moved to the country in the same area. I got drafted when I went to high school, and I got a deferment, and uh, went in the Army on August 15, 1950. I took my basic training in Breckenridge, Kentucky, and in April of 1951, I went to Seattle to be shipped overseas. Uh, we left uh, Seattle in April, about 3rd, and uh, it was 14 days going to Tokyo, Japan. Stayed there a week. Uh, they took us out to hear our rifles in. Then they put us on a train, went to Sasebo, Japan. And then we got on another ship, I guess, overnight to Pusan. And that's, uh, uh, we arrived in uh, Pusan in late April, and they signed me to the subdivision, 17th Regiment. We put on a train overnight to 150 miles north, uh, and went into the INR platoon, and the, uh, Uh, we arrived in regimental headquarters. I was assigned to headquarters company, INR, and our duties there were if the line troopers couldn't find the enemy, well, uh, we had to go out, and we walked out uh, and got on the old P, stayed overnight, and went out farther as far as we could just to make sure we had just uh, touched the enemy and got some fire and kind of find out how many they were and then return. I arrived as a private. My duty was radio man with the INR platoon. And uh, we went out on patrols, either by Jeep or walking. And uh, I didn't like the Jeep patrols too well. But uh, they were usually pretty fast. Uh, our platoon sergeant was Sergeant Biggs. He was a 19-year-old master sergeant and very, very good man. He was very strict when we went on the line, and uh, uh, he knew exactly what to do every time we got in trouble. So uh, I really couldn't, I'd say he brought us through. He saved our lives, what he did. And uh, he, uh, uh, I let all the patrols we went with, if uh, any, any one of the platoon, uh, uh, squads went out, he was leading them. So he was a very good man. And uh, I was a 300 radio operator. It was a 30-pound pack that uh, most squad use. Uh, you get 10 or 12 miles on it. And uh, it was very reliable radio. And some of the men in the platoon uh, were Guy Hamrick, Bill Snyder, and uh, uh, Hilton, uh, Albritton, uh, Bowden, uh, in May 51, we went on our first Jeep patrol. Uh, we went out about seven or eight miles out in front of the lines. Uh, we got fired upon. Sergeant told me to get down behind this pile of rocks. And uh, uh, we had 50 caliber machine guns on the Jeeps. And as uh, long as the 50s were shooting, the groups didn't shoot back. And uh, I, we stayed there for about 15, 20 minutes, shooting and carrying on. And we, we left there, come back to regimental headquarters and reported. Then two days later, we went back to the same spot. And the sergeant says, uh, you remember this spot? And I said, yeah. But I said, I don't see that pile of gravel that was uh, I got behind. He says, that's it right there. It was only about six inches high. And I got kind of scared, but you could see the gooks uh, shooting at you, see little white puffs of smoke. But uh, we found out one thing, they always kept, we had 550 caliber machine guns, and we kept one of them going all the time. And while it was going, there was no other fire coming back at you. And uh, we went on one night patrol, 
and uh, it was a squad of us, and we went out in front of the old peas, a mile and a half, two miles. We went sent out to get a, uh, a, a prisoner, and uh, this, we had two guys from California that were pretty rough, and they says, uh, we get the prisoner for you, you just stay back here, and they'd roam up in there. And when they finally got, they jumped in a hole with three goods, and they killed one, brought two back, without shooting any of them. <laughs> and when they come back, they said, well, get out of here. And it was like 4th of July, I never seen so much shooting in my life. And everybody got back out of there, but it was, it was one scary thing, I don't want to do it again. Nobody got hit, and I can't, I can't understand why, because there's so much shooting going on that uh, you think so hard to hit something. Well, when we broke contact, the sergeant says, now, when I tell you to run, you run. And, man, we run like we could. He says, don't tell me you're tired or you're horse busting. He says, because I know the communications, they think we're 100 yards short, and we just keep on going. And uh, we never had any problem at nighttime that I can think of, and uh, there was no uh, martyrs or anything like that. It was all machine gun and burp guns and stuff like that shooting at us. We could look back the trail, if we were on, on a day trail, where you could look back and you could just see them just ripping 100 yards behind us because they thought we was there instead of we'd be farther up the road. So that would be a good sign of, uh, of a sergeant doing a good job, I think. Most uh, most patrols is up and down hills. That's all they had over there. They had little valleys, tall hills, and you just uh, just roam around out there. Uh, sometimes we walk five, six miles out in there trying to make contact with the enemy. Once we made contact, that's all we had to do is kind of figure out how many people they had and get out of there. And uh, we went in winter time. We was up. Uh, just left to the punch bowl, and it turned bad. And uh, our platoon went up on the hill, and uh, the lieutenant told me, he said, stay back, get a new radio, and get a pair of boots. Well, that mo next morning, I went up on the hill, and uh, half of my platoon come off there, either sh uh, shot by sniper or frozen feet. And uh, we stayed up on that hill. It was a when you go up the hill in the morning, real early morning, it was froze. When you come back down in the evening, it'd be muddy. And that went on for about a week at that area. And uh, we were sent up on the hill to replace a platoon at a time so they could go down and get washed up. And uh, we did that for one time for six weeks straight. And the lieutenant thought we needed a bath, but well, we wasn't there. after the first week, you just was so dirty it scaled off, so it didn't make any difference after that. And uh, uh, we come back to our tents, uh, and uh, we was there about a week, and uh, they had a hard time getting me up, so they sold me out in the snow. And about three hours after they'd done that, they said, we're going to move. Well, we had to chop the tent out <laughs> on the ground because it was frozen to the ground, and we moved over uh, toward the uh, Watchon area then. And we was in Watchon. That's where we was, uh, had a little. We had little uh, pup tents like there, and we were right in the river. Uh, right in down there on the river sand, and we got a mission to go out and pick up 18 uh, dead servicemen of our own. And they call that the uh, valley, along, laid along the Wachon Reservoir, they were supposed to have been 10,000 dead in there. Well, they sent us out to pick up these Americans, and i never seen so many dead people in my life. There was one truck there that had 34 guys in it and never got out. And uh, there was all kind of wildlife, uh, shot limping around. Anyhow, we got all the way up there, we picked up 17 of these guys, we couldn't find the 18th one. And uh, this group come riding down the road, and uh, the sergeant pulled him off his bicycle. He was riding, and this group by it with interpreters said that there was an American up there in this little hut. It was shot five times. It was a 
fit to call him a machine gun. He said, but he was alive. And, and he was a little suspicious of that. And we had one guy in our outfit, that he had to have a piece of, of equipment all the time. Like, he had to have a 60, uh, 60 millimeter mortar, and he had to have a bazooka. And he had, uh, his 50 caliber had one box that was all tracers. So he told this group to go up there and get down and lay down flat in that building and they set the, we set it the fire with a tracer out of 50 caliber and rushed it. And this guy was up there. We pulled him out of there. He shot five times. And we had nothing but a stretcher to put him on. And the first thing the guy wanted was a cigarette. And uh, he didn't talk much, but he was, he was uh, conscious. And we hauled them about 17 miles in front of a jeep back home, back to the regimental headquarters. Took them to the aid station, and this lieutenant said, where is these tagging? The sergeant says, the gooks don't tag them. And uh, uh, that was kind of a real bad trip all day. When we entered this uh, valley along the uh, Watch Down Reservoir, there was, first there was a truck that would run off the road, and it was about a deuce and a half, and it was filled full of goose. With a napalm, it hit them, just burn them up. There was only one guy made it off of that, and as we went down to there, there were so many dead bodies, you couldn't hardly look out and not see several hundred dead bodies at one time. Uh, the animals were shut up. The, I'd say 150, 200 yards of width, they were just dead every place for about eight or 10 miles. They said that Missouri fired these big rounds and called the avalanche, and uh, the Air Corps come in there and lit it up and just machine gunned everything in it. They claimed we were shoulder deep trying to get out of there, and it just just killed everything. Uh, they there was no hardly no buildings. Everything was just shot up. It was uh, chopped up. Somewhere north of Seoul, we went in there and relieved uh, some uh, platoons in there. And during the night, this, uh, some of our own artillery shelled us. And I got on the phone and called the, the uh, lieutenant down there. And I said, say, shut that stuff off. I said, that's our stuff coming up here. And he started to query me, saying, uh, oh, how long you been over here and all that? And I said, well, I'll tell you, you've been over here long enough. She holds you, Ted. You better get it stopped. Well, the next morning he'd come up, he wanted to know who the guy was that uh, talked to him. I says, it was me. He said, well, you know, I'm on a court martial. I says, well, you, that's your luck. But I said, it'd be awful lucky for you to get down over that hill, too. You're a long way down. Well, he just walked off. Nothing ever happened to that. But they also, we had orders that next day that we had to dig latrines. And, well, they, didn't, they got dug all right with, with shovels. <laughs> but we didn't... Uh, we didn't lose any men there. It was uh, then we come back off of that hill in reserve, and uh, we had to take uh, a radio up on a hill, and I hurt myself up there, and uh, and I got a little R and R, you might say, for a couple of days, and that was that was about it. Yeah. Uh, we. Uh, I rotated out in April 1952, uh, and I was still a, a radio operator, and I was a staff sergeant. And uh, another little bit of information was I got three R&Rs in Japan, and was I probably the only one that ever done that. And uh, I enjoyed Army life only in, as in the United States. Never enjoyed Korea whatsoever. Uh, we re rotated out, and we went to uh, Sasebo, Japan, and we stayed there, and he was trying, I guess, trying to get us to re-up because, man, anything you wanted to eat or drink, they had there. Uh, we stayed there a week. I had all my clothes tapered, uh, tailored to fit. I got all the blackheads out while I was there, massages and all that. Uh, then they put us on a ship. It was 14 days coming back. We got into Seattle. We they take, took it to this uh, cafeteria, army cafeteria. Guys had big old white hats on to come around and wanted to know how they wanted the steaks and how many you could eat and all that. Fixed it exactly the way you wanted it. And 
Then they put us on a, a train and uh, shipped us across to, uh, uh, we got on a regular diesel train, went to Chicago, and from Chicago they put us on a big old steel wheeler locomotive and we was coming down and these guys was raiding hell because we fought in Korea and they put us in an old locomotive come down to Atterbury and this uh, colored uh, conductor says, well, this, well, how fast do you think you're going? And he, the conductor said we was doing 114 miles an hour <laughs> coming down the track. Well, they got us in Camp Atterbury. Big meal again. And then I rotated out of there. They give us a month off. And then when I almost lost my life, they had a thing out in front of the uh, uh, the road there. We just got in, and the guys would come along and pick you up, hitchhike, take you wherever you wanted to go, you know. Well, I got on that thing, and the guy had a Hudson Hornet. And, man, he just laid that thing on the floor. Well, we had about 100 miles to go. And when I got to where I think I'd get home, I got out of that thing because he was going to kill me right there on the spot. And when I was home, everything, you felt really relieved when you, when you got to the coast. You see, my man, you made it. He was a very lucky person. And, uh, and then I finished out my army in uh, Fort Rowdy, Kansas. I was an uh, athletic and recre recreation NCO and uh, had a very good lieutenant. And each week, every other weekend, I got a three-day pass. And a little thing that happened there was kind of funny. When I got hurt in Korea, which was not, act, I didn't get enemy action, but they had to operate on me. And uh, they put us in this ward and they had to circumcise me. <laughs> and this uh, uh, regiment wouldn't, receive, wouldn't let you be in unless you were circumcised. So here was a ward of 50 guys, and it was real funny walking down the hall, everybody grabbing their crouch to go to chow. So it was kind of a funny way to find up leaving the Army. Uh, about the association, I uh, I really enjoy it. We shoot the wars over. We meet the guys 50 years back, and they all seem like to get along good together. And and uh, it's just good to be around people you served a year with. That's the part I really like about it. I uh, seem like we shoot the war over every time, every year. And I hope I live long enough to see a hundred reunions. And uh, uh, it's just a good thing to belong to the association.